Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Today's topic is the so-called Seifert van Kampen theorem. Um, sometimes also just called van Kampen theorem. It depends a bit. So in particular, the, the source I'm using, which is Hatcher's book, linked in the description, Hatcher just calls it van Kampen theorem. Anyway, um, Wikipedia calls it Seifert van Kampen theorem. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I would call it Seifert van Kampen theorem. Probably mispronouncing those names anyway. So um, Seifert was a German mathematician. Van Kampen was, I think, a Dutch mathematician. Anyway, um, so the point will be this idea of cut and compute, basically. So it's this idea that you want to compute the fundamental group because we are doing algebraic topology. We don't need any reason to compute the fundamental group. This fundamental group is fundamental to algebraic topology. And um, the idea is to cut your space into reasonable bits and then compute the fundamental group for those bits and then piece everything back together. And in the end, the Seifert and Van Kampen theorem is probably the most important theorem in algebraic topology to compute the fundamental group. So today I will kind of try to motivate it, um, write down why it should work and what the main ingredients are and give you a nice example. So let's just jump right into it, right? So the whole point about algebraic topology is that algebra should reflect topology. It's kind of any kind of operation you do topologically should be kind of reflect in the algebra you uh, associate to, to, to your topological space. So let's do a kind of an easy example. I have my figure eight here, so my space X. And it, it certainly is in some sense made out of, uh, well, a left figure eight or whatever you want to call it, this, this circle with the, the, the red one here, the circle with a slight, whatever it's, whatever it is, this is space U and um, on the other hand, this guy, and they are kind of glued together along this middle bit, this U intersect V. And topologically, this is just clear, you have those two, well, circles, and you make both of them a little bit bigger, uh, going a little bit into the other circle, but not too much here and here. And then they overlap and you can think of your space as being glued together for those pieces, U and V along the intersection. Right? It doesn't really matter whether we can make that precise or not, but it, it's kind of obvious that there should be the a right definition making this work, such that you can say, yeah, well, my space is actually whatever those symbols mean, right? My space is glued together out of the piece U and out of the piece V along the intersection. Okay, very good. And we are doing algebraic topology, so we hope or we hope for, or in some sense, we want to construct our invariants such as they reflect um, those properties. For example, it would be really, really nice to have just this formula translated into algebra as follows. Well, X is glued together from U and V along the intersection. So the fundamental group of X should be glued together from the fundamental group of V, uh, U and the fundamental group of V along the intersection. And that's basically what the seifert van Kampen theorem says. And then you can think of cutting your space into pieces and computing the fundamental group for U and V and pasting it together to get the fundamental group of X. And that's exactly why the theorem is so important in practice. Um, so let me start off by explaining what this funny symbol in the end will mean, this um, asterisk. So the, the star product, it's called the free product. It's um, actually a very easy idea. So this idea of freeness in algebra, link is in the description. So free vector space, free group, a free module, free ring, something like that, uh, free category, whatever. Um, and this, uh, the idea is now to, to use this concept of being free and by just glue together two groups in the freest possible way. And what do I mean by that? Well, here's a formal description. So I have two groups, G and H, and I want to form this new uh, free product group, G star H or G asterisk H, whatever. And well, it, it's uniquely determined by certain properties, but actually what you really do in practice is the following. 
So G comes to you in a certain description. Let's say your, your G is given by a certain uh, number of generators, which are usually denoted by S, so certain elements in G and every element in G can be generated by, by just concatenation of those symbols from S and there's a certain set of relations R, G. And the same for H, just with, with H here. So if I have H, I would just write H here. So certain number of generators, certain number of relations. Then the free product is really just the naive construction you can do if you want to uh, keep this idea of having some free object in mind. It's a free object which is generated by exactly the, the, the elements from G and the elements from H by the same generators. Right? Naively, you just take exactly the, the, the union of those generators and you need to impose relations on this group and you impose the minimal possible number of relations, namely only the relations from G and H and nothing else. In particular, G star H will never have cross relations. Uh, what I mean by cross relations, well, let's have a look at an example. So let's say G is uh, this um, group here, which is Z mod five. So I have one generator S and the one generator to the fifth power is one. That's the same as Z mod five, of course. Um, I have H, H has a generator T and the fourth power of T is one, that's Z mod four. So what is Z mod five star Z mod four? Well, it's this infinite group given by this presentation here. And this really just means, okay, you have now two generators S and T and they satisfy still the relations they satisfied before S to the fifth, T to the fourth, equals one, so both of them separately, but there is no cross relation. There's no relation involving S and T, uh, not, not, not a single one. And that's kind of the minimal number of relations you would impose such that you still have G and H as, as subgroups. So in particular, if you, you can write down a word like this and it's not trivial because you just can't do anything to it and so on. You, you can make it as long as you want for any end. So this group is certainly infinite. You just write down ST, 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 ST. And actually the, the general word in this case would be uh, S to the K, well, let's say K1, T to the J1, whatever, S to the K2 and so on. You're always alternating and the K runs from, um, uh, in a reasonable way from zero to four. In a reasonable way means <laughs> if, if you, so you always want the symbol S. If you want to ignore the symbol S, you kind of concatenate the two Ts um, to create a bigger T. Anyway, um, but, but certainly this is an infinite group and you never have to think whether there are relations involving G and H. There's never a relation involving both. They're completely separate to one another. They're glued together in the free, in freest possible way. And that turns out to be the right object to study. So let's see why actually. So we know that U and V cover our MySpace X. So MySpace X is now, um, well, this space here. Uh, it's just it is just an illustration, of course. And I cut it like this. So I have my piece V here and I have piece, piece U here and I have intersection in the middle. And I'm considering a, a, a loop, right? I want to co uh, compute the fundamental group. So I consider a loop. So I start here at my base point and my loop goes all the way along here, flop and goes back. The loop in the space, it's, it's F. It's a concatenation of F1, F2 and F3. Um, that's good. That's a potential loop that you would see in, would see in, a, in the fundamental group. But you can, you can write it actually in a nice way. You can write it as a product of things in exactly this, this sense in some, um, as a product of things which completely live in U or V. And how you do this, well, let me just do it for, for F1. So F1 starts here, goes here, and still in V, still in V, and at one point it want to cross into U. So instead of crossing into U, you just go back a G inverse. So you just run G inverse back. And this is certainly just an element of V. Similarly, you can whatever, go, uh, now, G this way to come and bop, and this is an element of U. And this, the last one will be again an element of, uh, of V and it runs like this. Okay, 
So you can decompose your pass into a bit from you, a bit from V, a bit from you, a bit from V, and so on. And if you have more copies, then you can do it with more copies, of course. Um, and that's basically just saying that there is a subjection from this free product group where you just write u, v's, u, v's, u, v's um, into, 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 your, into your group that you're interested in. So they span. And the whole point about the Seifert von Kappen theorem uh, would be to compute uh, the kernel of this map. Because if you have a group homomorphism, which is subjective, you get an isomorphism up to factoring uh, the kernel. And the precise statement is then that you have a topological space, of course, and you want to compute um, the fundamental group of this topological space. And you always want to have something path connected. You could see here in this picture why you want to have something path connected, because you will always want to play around with those paths, and they always should contain the, um, the fixed base point. But anyway, so the main idea is the following. You have those sets u, i, and they cover my space X in, in a good way. So intersections are pass connected exactly because of what I just showed, showed here that I want to shortcut and I want to push pieces completely into one U and push piece, another piece completely into another U. Then um, the U I cover, which means that this natural map here, so the notation is explained down here, the natural map um, is actually subjective. So you can cut a, a, a pass and a piece here, and a cut a pass and a piece here, and that's what you do. And that's this additional condition, um, which is kind of the, really the, the main meat, which identifies the kernel of the map phi. And well, usually, if you want to like to compute uh, the fundamental group of the space, so this is always a little bit tricky. Um, it's not super hard, but you need to sit down to do it. So I don't want to go too much into details here. I would just, uh, well, link is of course in the description, Hatcher does it in a uh, lot of details. I would just leave it here and rather stress the uh, maybe the easiest to remember and kind of most useful in some sense version of the theorem is if the intersection U and V is contractible, it's, it's homotopy equivalent to a point like um, exactly in this example, this is contractible to a point. This is just a point, which I shouldn't denote a star, but anyway, it's a point. Um, then it, it, this is of course completely nonsense. <laughs> there should be pi one of u star pi one of v <laughs> instead of u star v. So then pi one of x is really just the free product over the, over the two spaces. That's how you usually apply it in practice. So the main point about this part of the theorem is that all of those relations live actually in those intersections. So if intersections are contractible, they are homotopy equivalent to a point, you're good. Then you don't have any relations and you really get an isomorphism of the map. Very nice theorem. So let me show you how to apply this in practice. So for example, you, a, a graph is just a collection of lines and dots. So it certainly is a topological space in, in the naive sense that it's, it's a collection of intervals. Um, you could think of it as a basic example of a one-dimensional CW complex. Or... Anyway, so you want to compute the fundamental group of the graph. And this might not be completely trivial. So if you take this graph here on the right-hand side, um, it's not quite clear how to compute its fundamental group. It, it's strange, it, you can't embed this graph. So it looks a little bit strange and uh, you don't really know where circles are or whatever, but there's a really nice and easy and easy to remember way to compute the fundamental group of a graph. It's a free product of copies of Z along certain edges. So my edges here are those in blue. And in this case, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. And it, it works as follows. There's are the edges that you obtain by taking a, a spanning tree, which is this guy here, the, the one in, uh, in red, and takes a complement. So everything not contained in the spanning tree. And there's a very easy reason to see why this should be true, because you can do the following trick. Um, so the space T will correspond to U intersect V from um, the theorem from before, from the seifert kappen theorem. So this intersection is a tree. So something, something like that, whatever, a tree, a graph. So it's certainly contractible to a point 
So if you can apply Seifert von Kampen, the intersection is trivial. So uh, no relation, so three problems. As we are only need to, count, need to count the number of circles because for each circle, that's my main ingredient here, you should see a copy of, C, of the integers. And how to count circles in a graph? Well, take the spanning tree. And what makes it the spanning tree is whenever you add an edge, which is not in your tree, you create a unique cycle. You cre create a unique cycle in your, mm -hmm. in, your, um, in your graph. So here I added this edge E here and the green one here, which is not a completely obvious cycle, but it is, it is a unique cycle. So you add this edge E, you get a unique cycle with some um, boundary nonsense here. So it stretches out a little bit, but this is not important because all of this is um, exactly like, like those guys here. You can just squeeze it in. It's not important. Well, it's not important for the argument I'm going to do here. Um, so you can just squeeze it in, you get a circle. Each circle creates you a copy of Z in the pi one. You apply Seifert van Kampen and you see that um, the, the pi one of the graph is just the product over the edges not contained in the span. It's, I mean, this is a really, really short argument to compute and, and slick and rememberable, I, I like it, argument to compute the fundamental group of a wide class of topological spaces for any, any gr reasonable graph. Anyway, um, so let me wrap up. Seifert von Kampen is this idea of cut things into smaller bits, compute um, the whatever you want to compute from those bits and paste them together in a nice way. And it's extremely applicable uh, to compute uh, fundamental groups. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.